October and did a wonderful presentation on the First Ladies. And I'm really excited that they're back to talk about Rosie the River and the women of World War II. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting us back. And before we get started, we are honored today to have a real Rosie the Riveter amongst us. Faye Camise is your very own personal Rosie the Riveter. She worked in an airplane factory. Um, on the night shift on the assembly line, so she can identify with what we're going to talk about. Um, this is a very magnificent story, uh, and it's one that doesn't really get told a lot, uh, because we have a tendency to focus on the achievements of the war and the men in the war, but there was an entire brigade, there was an entire population of women who were left behind and actually ran this country. So we have to clear up a couple of things before we get started. There is one major misconception about Rosie the Riveter. How many of you recognize this picture as Rosie? Right. Well, it isn't. Uh, this picture was actually drawn by a gentleman named J. Howard Miller, who was an artist for Westinghouse. Um, he used this in the campaign that I'm going to talk to you about, recruiting women to come into the workforce. And the reason that picture is actually called we can do it. The reason you see her and why she's used is because there's no copyright. So people can just go ahead and use it on mugs and calendars and any place they want to. This is the real Rosie the Riveter. She was actually drawn by Norman Rockwell. She appeared for the first time on May 29, 1943 on the cover of um, the uh, Saturday Evening Post. Now, uh, you can see Rosie here, she's a perfect depiction of who and what the women who were running our factories were like. She looks to be a little bit muscular, she has got a dirty face, she is wearing nail polish, she's wearing loafers, and she has her foot on a book. And the name of the title of that book is called Mein Kampf, which is why she has her foot on it. Um, she's eating her lunch with her riveting gun across her lap, and she personifies the women who answered the call of the time. Now, when Norman Rockwell was commissioned to do her, he actually used a model from his hometown. It was, she was a 19-year-old named Mary Doyle. When he did the first drawings of her, um, she didn't come across the way he wanted Rosie to come across, and so he enhanced her, and then he had to write an apology note to Mary Doyle, who was a tiny little thing, and say, I'm awful sorry that I made you look like that, but, you know, your personality came through. Now, this was originally a, an oil on canvas, and it was published, when it was published in the Saturday Evening Post, um, people recognized a similarity here between Rosie and her pose and uh, Isaiah on the Sistine Chapel. And uh, when they asked Norman Rockwell, did Isaiah influence you in any way or shape or form, he said he really didn't know that Isaiah was sitting like that. He just felt that this was the appropriate pose for Rosie. Now in 2002, the original oil on canvas of Rosie the Riveter sold for $4.95 million at Sotheby's at an auction. So now let's go talk about the real ladies. The woman who is an outstanding contributing member of a world that is created because of a war. Now, what happens is we have a new workforce that's required because the men are being drafted and going overseas, leaving jobs open here in the United States. We also have the passage of the Lend-Lease Act by uh, President Roosevelt, which lifts the ban on sending armaments overseas. So we not only have to replace the men that are leaving, we have to increase our production so that we can support predominantly England. <coughs> Uh, we also have the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which brings us into the war, and because of the loss of ships and, ships and aircraft, again, production has to ramp up. Uh, existing factories, like the automobile plants, are transformed into, create, into building things like tanks, airplanes, and whatever else we needed. My father-in-law used to work at IBM in the Hudson Valley. That was a place that used to make business machines. Well, for the war, the duration of the war became a rifle factory, or a gun manufacturer, and that's where he worked. Now, between 1941 and 1944, 
we have a major recruitment of women going on. And so they have to convince women that it's time for them to leave the home and to come out into the workplace. The uh, U.S. Office of War Information puts a magazine out and tells the uh, ladies' magazines like Harper's Bazaar and the ones that are existing different uh, approaches to take to recruit the women into the workplace. They start calling them production soldiers. Uh, they appeal to their sense of patriotism, the glamour of working. I don't know, Faye, if there was very glamorous on that assembly line or not, but that's how they put it in the magazines, that it was glamorous for you to participate. Um, they also said that there was good pay out there. And so women begin to come into the workplace. Now, in 1943, we find out that not only do we need folks working in the factories, but there's a whole bunch of civilian jobs that are open. And so once again, we go back to uh, Mr. Rockwell, who produces this painting called Liberty Girl. Now, as you can see, the Liberty Girl is carrying the tools of many of the civilian jobs available. You can see the time clock over here for the, the guards, a nurse's cap, someone working in agriculture, um, all uh, typewriters. There's all kinds of openings out there. And so once again, we go back to the uh, women and say, hey, you can be a conductor, or you can run the tell, you can be a telephone operator. There are lots of jobs you can do out here, and the country needs you. Now, the pre-war workplace was not a good place for women. The only ones that were working at this period of time was the, um, the uh, blue-collar workers, unskilled, and most of the people who were there were from minorities, uh, minor were minorities or very poor. Uh, it was required that a middle-class woman who uh, was working would retire when she married, or it would be reflected poorly on her husband. Um, working women were expected to resign their positions, even prior to marriage. Um, they would, so they were temporary workers. Um, society learned what middle class women already knew, that you can work and have a home, that uh, many of the domestic skills that we as women possessed at the time were very usable in industry. And in this campaign I was telling you about, they would said if you could, uh, you could rivet, if you could sew, and if you could put an apple pie together, then you could work an assembly line. Um, and articles were, were written many times showing women how to transfer their domestic skills into the workplace. Now, the question becomes, as the, it, the recruitment expands, where did they come from? Well, they came from all over. According to Sheridan Harvey at the Library of Congress, there were women who were already working in the lower paying jobs that moved into the factories and the civilian jobs as they became available. Matter of fact, 600 laundries closed around the country as the laundresses were moving into better paying positions. Uh, there were women who had lost their jobs during the Depression. Remember, when the Depression hit, the first ones to go were always the women because they were, it was felt that their income wasn't necessary. The men needed to support their family. And we also had first-time workers that were being recruited by the government. Um, they, why did they do it? Well, they decided they wanted to participate, they wanted to experience the sense of independence that was being advertised, and they wanted to have a feeling of fulfillment outside the home. Now, there were many obstacles. Uh, when this first started, this campaign to bring women into the workplace first started, um, especially during the Depression, Men and women were against women in the workplace. They felt men needed to be out there. They needed the job to support their family. By 1936, 80% of the Americans believed that the woman should not work outside the home if the husband had a job. Uh, single women really didn't need to work because they could find somebody to take care of a family or whatever. Now, this isn't me. These are statistics that are out there. And in today's day and age, this is hard to believe. But there was a period of time when society looked at women this way as the chief caregivers and homemaker. Um, they felt that it was necessary for a woman to stay in the home in order for the children to not turn into juvenile delinquents and be run in the streets wild. Um, so on October 12, 1942, in one of his fireside chats, FDR told the employers that they could no longer afford to cling to these ridiculous 
concepts. We needed butts and elbows out there working, and so we have to accept these women into the workplace uh, because the need of the country was too great. Now, despite that, they were not well received. Faye, I don't know what happened with you, but in many of the uh, factories, the girls were called dollies, lipsticks, Men would make remarks about them as they passed. They would tease them. They would send them off to get something that didn't exist. Um, and at first, um, they were worried. The men were worried because they were afraid these women were taking these jobs. And then when their, com their, their colleagues came back from the war, there would be no work for the men. Um, they were also concerned that the, woman couldn't, the women couldn't keep up. And in the beginning, it was a rough start for them uh, because of the way life was. Today, we have stores that are open 24 hours. Um, it actually, at this period of time, took the intervention of Eleanor Roosevelt to tell the banks that they had to adjust their hours or to tell the butchers and the, the uh, grocery stores, don't put all your stock out. Because we had women who were working the graveyard shifts and the night shifts. And by the time they got to the stores, the shelves were literally empty. And so Eleanor comes out and says, you know, you people have to do something. Um, the other problem we had was the child care. Um, it was expected that a woman stood home and took care of her own children. And unlike today, where you've got these daycare centers that open at 6 in the morning and close at 8 o'clock at night, there wasn't that kind of child care originally available to the women at this time. Um, so the first thing they did was, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, worked very hard to get federal funding for uh, daycare centers for the children, and there were several that were established by 1942 in the Lenin Act. Now, what happened was they were usually in public schools, and they were staffed by people, anyone who applied for the job and was found okay. What happened was um, people were starting to get very concerned that this was not working, and by the way, this, this appeared to be almost like a welfare kind of thing. Finally, again, uh, Roosevelt takes a stand, and the Family Welfare Association of America puts out posters that says, this is not a charity, this is a war. And so, again, God bless Eleanor Roosevelt, she steps in, and she, starts, she finds out about this thing called the Kaiser Experiment. Uh, the Kaiser Corporation was actually in Richmond, California, and Portland, Oregon. They had two major plants. Uh, what they did was they opened up a 24-hour daycare service right on the campus. They staffed it with teachers and registered nurses. And uh, within a year, there were 3,100 daycare centers built on this model all over the United States. And finally, women had the support that they needed. Now, the other problem we had was housing. Um, a lot of the plants were bringing in people from the rural areas, and there was really no place for them to stay. Landlords were very reluctant to uh, rent to women. According to the statistics out there, uh, they, their reluctance came because women wanted too much. You know, a gentleman wanted a bed to lay down in, and that was about it. Um, and was willing to use the, the toilet in the hallway, women were looking for some place to maybe make a meal and wash their clothes, and so they were considered demanding. Um, companies found that in order to facilitate these people that they were bringing in from the rural areas, they had to either build dormitories or rent housing specifically for the women workers, and some of them started to stay at the local W uh, YMCA. Now, uh, women, during the war, worked what was known as the double shift. Regardless of where they worked in the factories, they would work all day and then have to go home to be head of household. And one of the major things that the women of World War II proved was that they were very capable of doing this. The children didn't turn into juvenile delinquents. They still participated in their communities and their religious affiliations, and they went to work every day. Um, the, the schedule that they worked were 12 hours Monday to Friday, 10 hours on Saturday, 8 hours on Sunday. Gee. And uh, others worked a 48 hour week with overtime as required. Sound familiar, Faye? <laughs> so, now, uh, we come into the thing of deprivation and rationing. 
This is also becoming necessary here in the country. Young people start to postpone the idea of marriage uh, because couples could really not afford to support a family at this point, especially with him gone. Uh, many times you had multiple families living together, um, not only because it defrayed the cost of living, but because it also provided childcare. I'll work second shift, you work the graveyard shift, I'll watch your kids, you watch mine. Um, substitution and re recycling became um, the modus operandi of the times, and frugality was a virtue. Um, the old phrase became, buy it new, wear it out, make it do, do without. Okay. Now we have a new world for women. Um, they found a new independence. They were experiencing freedom, being away from their mothers, their husbands, their fathers, uh, especially the girls that were coming in from the rural areas. In many cases, some of them, it was the first time they saw a pay telephone and a flush toilet. Um, this is just because they were rural people. Um, there was a lot of relocation going on. Uh, they were finding that they were extremely successful outside the home. Um, they were learning new skills in both the civilian jobs and in the factory jobs, and they were breaking into career fields that were previously closed to them. They were feeling really good about themselves because they're contributing to the war effort. Um, they also had new social interactions beyond their neighborhoods and their religious affiliations. They were now having what we call networks today, working with their colleagues in the factories and forming new friendships and relationships. And it also gave a good foundation to their post-war dreams. Many of them were waiting for him to come home so they could have that little cottage with the white picket fence, and she was taking part of her salary stick it in a sock to help that happen. My sister still saves money in a sock, right? I don't know if she got it from my mother or what. Okay, so what were they doing? Well, in the industries, they were working in shipyards, uh, turning out one battleship every 10 days. In one shipyard in California, 576 ships were produced in 18 months with a predominantly female workforce. That's 32 ships a month. That's more than one a day. Uh, they worked in the aircraft plants all over the country, building uh, uh, plane engines, B-24 bombers, and other different type aircrafts. They were welders. They were munition working in munitions factory. They learned to fix generators, alternators, and other small engine parts, and they found that women were more adept at handling these things on the assembly line. For some reason, we have better dexterity than men do. Um, she was inspecting screws on the airplane wings, and because she was small, she was asked to crawl into the gas tanks to make sure that the welds were still in place. Um, she was made, she was making artillery castings and assembling uh, explosives. She poured molten steel, operated heavy cranes and drills. She unloaded heavy cargo and drove tractors and built gliders and dirigibles. Now, one of the things we need to remember about these wonderful women is the fact that our protections that are in place today, whether it be the unions or whatever, did not exist then, and OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, did not exist at the time. So they were exposed, some of these women, to chemicals that um, were highly uh, carcinogen. They had asbestos all around them, um, especially in the munitions plants. They had paints and sealants that had organic compounds that are banned today. You can't even bring them in the factories today. And these ladies were working with that stuff with their hands. Safety clothing. I'm dressed the way I am. You can see my clothes don't fit very well. And I'm wearing a pair of loafers because that's what was available to me. When women first went in there, they weren't given safety shoes like they have today. And the gloves that they had to wear to handle the hot steel were huge on their hands. Um, so it wasn't until 1943 that they actually had changed uh, the way industry worked for women for safety. Now, on civilian jobs, they worked in railroad tra on railroad track gangs, actually laying track um, in lumber and steel mills. They were taxi cab drivers and streetcar conductors. They were clerks, typists, bank managers. And some went to Washington looking for the new administrative jobs that were opening up in the government. They were called Gigi Girls. Now, changing perceptions. And this is probably the most wonderful thing about this. Uh, when the women were first employed, um, it was almost an assumption 
that they were not going to be capable to do this. And this is a, this is a contributing theme. Um, it goes back to the women of the Civil War, where they were considered incapable. Um, and what we've always had to do is prove it. And these women stepped up and did exactly that. Um, their output was equivalent to, and in some cases better than their male counterparts. Um, they were observed to be better at jobs that required patience and accuracy. Um, they excelled in precise and delicate work on small objects. They had that manual dexterity that we talked about. They were eager to learn and they took their job seriously and they managed to learn how to balance that home life and their work. Um, their output was consistent and steady and they showed up. That was the biggest thing. Uh, they took great pride in their work, and not only that, they actually had fewer accidents than their male counterparts for some reason. They were more careful, I don't know. Um, their work ethic, excellence and performance and dedication dispelled the ideas that women couldn't do it, such that by the end of the war, um, they were considered comrades in arms, uh, and the men in the factory welcomed them and sought them out. Now, for those who are not working in either civilian jobs or regular jobs, there were plenty of volunteer activities going around in the country that were supporting the war effort. And one of those, of course, was the bond drives. Um, the bonds were sold. You could have money taken out of your paycheck to buy them. Um, there were thousands of bonds sold, millions sold. And through the bond drives, uh, women who were out there on the stump selling them actually raised 185 billion, that's with a B, dollars um, due to the sale of war bonds. Now, uh, thousand, thousands of women were working there. Uh, we had one lady named Laverne um, in Minnesota who actually raised $40,000 in a weekend. What she did was she owned a theater in, out in Minnesota, and what she had was a car that had been at, at Pearl Harbor, just a touring car that had been shot up. She had it shipped out to her theater, parked it in front of the theater with the top down. And just for people either passing by or going to the movies that weekend, they would throw money in it. She had $40,000 by Monday morning. There was another lady of Bayonne, New Jersey. Her name was Sophie Levine. She sold almost a million dollars in war bonds in between 1941 and 1945. Now that was a statistic that Brian found when we were researching the material for this uh, discussion. We were doing this particular performance at another venue, and this man comes over to me and says, I knew Sophie Levine. So she's a real honest to gosh person, and he said she was a lovely, lovely woman who really, really cared and felt that this was the way she was going to contribute to the war. So that was kind of nice to put a face on her. Um, now, there were other women volunteer organizations throughout the United States. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the one that was most impressive was the American Women's Volunteer Service. It was founded by a lady named Alice Throckmorton McLean. She was a very wealthy socialite and had the uh, opportunity to travel a lot in Great Britain. And what she did was she came back and she based the structure of this voluntary uh, auxiliary regroup on what was the uh, British format. By the time Pearl Harbor was bombed, there were 18,000 fully trained women in the organization. To, they were trained to do automobile mechanics, cryptography, and switchboard operation. They could also set up mobile kitchen operations and emergency medical aid stations and were trained to staff those as well. The organization turned out more than a million new or reconditioned articles of clothing that were being shipped overseas. And the membership itself sold over a billion dollars worth of war bonds. So they actually uh, were quite productive. Now, the other one I wanted to talk about was the Civil Air Patrol. Um, these are women who actually have their pilot's license and were either pilots or working as technical support on the airplanes. They were doing pre-flight preparations. They were working as spotters for enemy aircraft should they come in. And they also were trained air raid wardens in case um, we were attacked, God forbid. Uh, others ran all kinds of service clubs and libraries um, and all kinds of, of other uh, activities to support either the troops or the civilians that were left behind.
Now, recycling and substitution was considered a patriotic duty. Uh, recipes were adapted to deal with the shortages of sugar and dairy products. Um, recycling of metals was very important. People actually took the bumpers off their cars and turned them in. Um, waste paper was collected to make fuses for the bombs and bones were processed into explosives. Uh, and women were encouraged to plant victory gardens. By 1944, 21 million families in the United States had planted 7 million acres and yielded 8 million, 8, uh, million tons of vegetables. Now, um, our neighbor across the street tells the story of how he, the requirement in his household was every Saturday morning he and his brother had to go up and down uh, the neighborhood and, and find scrap and knock on doors and collect scrap metal um, in their wagon before they could go play or do whatever they were going to do. Now we've talked about women who are working in civilian jobs and in the plants. We also have women who are working in volunteer services. There's a whole other bunch of women out there who are in the armed forces. Um, we're going to go through them very quickly. But um, we have the WAX, which is the Women's Army Corps. They were predominantly army nurses. Um, but then they began to accompany the troops. They weren't supposed to leave the United States, but we had army nurses um, at Anzio, and uh, we had army nurses that were all over Europe with our boys. You had, then they were called WAX. Then you have the WAVES, which are women accepted for voluntary emergency services. Again, we've had uh, Navy nurses since 1908, but in this particular war, again, the waves not only were nurses, they started to go, as, as the Army women did, go into the regular jobs that were being performed stateside by the men. Quartermasters, cooks, um, disbursement officers, whatever it took. They, too, were greeted with an icy reception because as these women took over these jobs on the bases, the men were being sent into active duty overseas. We then have the uh, SPARS, which stand for Semper Paratus, Always Ready, and that is the women's uh, branch of the United States Coast Guard. So we had women in the Coast Guard during World War II. And then we had women in the Marines, and unlike the waves, the wax, and the SPARS, the female Marines were called Marines. Now, this is a really cute story as to how the female Marines got started. Um, there was a woman named Ruth Streeter who decided she wanted to be of service to her country. And she'd always been interested in flying. So she took flying lessons at the age of 45 and got her pilot's license. And then she applied to join the WASPs that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, uh, the Women's Air Patrol. And so was told that she exceeded the age limit for that group by 12 years. <laughs> Well, then she tried to join the Civil Air Patrol, especially in New Jersey. This is a New Jersey story because that's where we're from. But um, she was told, oh no, it's too dangerous for you to fly along the coast of New Jersey and you know, monitor the beaches. Well, this lady had some very influential friends, and so being she wasn't going to take no for an answer, in 1943, she called her buddy, who happened to have a direct line into FDR, and said, um, Look, there's this woman out there who really, really wants to do something. So FDR, with his quirky personality, turned around and made her head of the female Marine Corps. That'll learn him to say no. Now, this is my most favorite batch of women. Not that everyone didn't contribute, but these girls were really unique. Um, they're called WASPs, which is Women's Air Force Service Pilots. Now, these WASPs were not part of the American Air Force because we really didn't have an Air Force uh, yet as a separate entity. There was the Army Air Corps and the Navy Air Corps, um, but the Air Force itself was not in existence. And so um, these women were the first to fly military aircraft for the U.S. Army Air Corps. Uh, they were founded by a woman named Nancy Harkness Love and Jacqueline Cochran, both who were running pilot schools. And they decided, or schools for female pilots, and they decided, let's throw in together and put, put this group. Now, the two groups joined to form the WASPs, um, but they were not military. They were not considered part of the military. They were under the Civil Service Commission. And they, though they functioned as part of the military, between September of 42 and December of 44, they were uh, 
They were not considered to be military personnel. They were stationed at 120 army bases around the United States and earned $250 a month. Um, because they were civilians, they had no benefits, <coughs> pensions, or any kind of uh, recognition other than what they did. They flew 78 different types of aircraft, including the B-29. And what they basically used to do is take the um, planes from the manufacturing uh, areas and fly them to the deportation areas so that they could be brought overseas. Um, they also, they, they logged over 60 million miles ferrying planes from one place to the other. Um, they also flew planes to the repair depot. That makes me a little nervous. If I have to take this plane in to be fixed, you're asking me to fly it. Think about it. Um, they also flew navigational training flights and towed targets for live ammunition aircraft and gunnery practice. Uh, there's a story that was really cute that we found in doing the research about a woman who was ferrying a plane to these repair depots and um, when she took the plane, they handed her a clipboard and said, give it to the guy at the other end. Well, she flies this plane there, and when she gets there, she says to the receiving gentleman, this was a nightmare. She said, I could barely control this thing, and it shook, and it rattled, and it made all kinds of horrible noises. She says, I don't know what's wrong with it, because I can't read what's on the clipboard. The guy looks at it, he said, no wonder you had trouble. The engine is only hand-bolted. Oh. Think about it. This engine is shaking around in the front of this airplane. But this happened. 38 of these pilots were killed uh, during the course of the war while working with the Army Air Corps. Now, what happens is um, it took until 1972 to give them military status. Up until that time, they were chipping in to pay for military-type funerals for their comrades out of their own pockets. Um, let's talk about the demographics. Women in the military, um, it was a mixed bag. Some of them were right out of high school. Some of them were college graduates. Some of them were single and in their 20s and 30s. And some of them were older and married. And it was just like when the women first went into the plants. At first it was, if you have a child under 16, you can't come and work here. Then as we had more and more demand for workers, it became under six, you can't work here. After they opened up the Kaiser experiment all around the country, it was if you can come here, stand up and take nourishment, come and work. Um, and so it happened. Is the same in the military. Now, unlike the women of World War I and the Civil War, uh, they were not wearing these ridiculous big dresses with the crinolines and the hoops and everything else and trying to do a job. Uh, they wore the same military clothing as the men did, um, jackets, helmets, and boots, but they did not have a weapon. They were not issued a weapon. They did go through the same boot camp as the men did. Um, the personnel that was stationed in the South Pacific wore long sleeve cotton shirts and pants um, because of the mosquitoes, and the women dressed as the men did. Uh, they had to learn the military lingo, like mess for the dining room and head for the toilet if you were in the Navy. Um, and again, what they did was uh, they did, I'm not going to read all this to you, but take a look at the, the major, major um, jobs that they did while they were there. And one of the things that was not known um, is that we had women who actually were working on the Manhattan Project and also the preparation for D-Day. Now these girls were never given a whole lot of, um, you know, a whole lot of uh, recognition, but they were there and they were an intricate part of what happened and the success. Now let's talk about women in combat. Um, they were on troop transports. Uh, carrying the wounded from North Africa. Five nurses were torpedoed, um, rescued, but um, had a pretty rough time of it. The nurses in the wax were with the troops when they made the invasion of Sicily. 46 army nurses were killed in that campaign. The wax and the waves landed in France and Germany with our forces from the D-Day inv invasion. And 5,500 wax and waves were stationed in the South Pacific. Um, 56 army nurses were killed in a kamikaze attack on a hospital ship. Um, the WAX and the WAVES also did air evacuation flights for the wounded. Um, they would transport, as did the Navy nurses. Um, the Navy nurses worked under heavy Japanese fire um, as the United States is in Burma. The United States bases in Burma, Midway, and the Philippines were attacked. 
they also were running with the troops on the uh, Bataan Peninsula, if you remember the Bataan Death March and Corregidor. Uh, they slept in tents and on cots. They coped with cold and snow and scorpions and tarantulas, just like their male counterparts did, to the point where in the, in the South Pacific, they used to have to put the legs of the cots in cans of water to keep the bugs from crawling up the legs of the cot and getting into their sheets. Um, over 400 U.S. service women and nurses died during World War II. Now, as far as prisoners of war went, we had 66 Army nurses, 11 Navy nurses, and several other personnel who were, in fact, captured either by the Japanese or the Germans. Um, but they were all released, and they all survived their internment. Um, in November of uh, 1943, a plane evacuating the wounded from Sicily crashed in German-occupied Albania. Thirteen nurses and 17 servicemen were helped by the Albanian underground to elude um, the occupying forces. They walked 800 miles <coughs> across mountains to reach the safety of the Allies. It took them two months, but they did it. Now the perception, as I told you, Women initially were not uh, well received, uh, partially because they were considered incapable, partially because they were freeing up men to go into active duty when they had originally had stateside assignments. Um, what happened was Brigadier General Elizabeth P. Hoisington of the Women's Army Corps stated, the temperature that first winter could not have been colder than the reception given the Army women. Colonel Mary Holleran stated in a letter to the WACs who served in Europe, there were many who bet against you, and they all lost. And most important, I think, is uh, General Douglas MacArthur, who was head of the United States Forces in the Pacific, said that the WACs were his best soldiers. So they were given recognition across the board that they had to earn the hard way. Now, as far as awards go, um, they received every award from the Air Medal, the Distinguished Service Medal, the Bronze Star, Silver Star, Purple Heart, Distinguished Flying Crosses, um, Legion of Merit, <coughs> Army Commendation Medal, and Soldier's Medal. The one that's missing here is the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, they didn't give it to them. Now, we also have women who were working in covert, covert operations. The Office of Strategic Services um, was the forerunner of the CIA. Now, we had 4,000 non-military women during World War II working as intelligence agents both in the United States and abroad. They were saboteurs, cryptographers, cartographers, analysts, and propaganda specialists. Um, there are two that kind of highlight what the women did. The first one was in the European theater. Her name was Virginia Hall. She worked with the French resistance and was given the Distinguished Service Cross for her work. She was known as the limping lady because she actually had a wooden leg. She had lost it during one of the operations. Instead of coming home, she decided to stay. And so she made herself up like an old French woman that used to limp. Um, now, during the height of the Nazi occupation of France, um, she was working with the French resistance to get the downed flyers, the American and um, Allied flyers that were shot out of the sky off to safety, and also she was working with the um, resistance to maintain radio communication so that we could communicate back and forth for the preparation of D-Day. Now what happens is she gave her leg, her wooden leg, a name called Cut Birth. I don't know why she did, but as you know, most of your Secret Service agents or most of your um, undercover people have what they call a handler. Well, this one night, her handler must have been off or in the bathroom or whatever, and she sends a message back to home headquarters and says, I hope I don't have trouble with Cuthbert tonight, meaning the weather was bad and she was worried about her leg. Well, the fellow that was at the other end receiving it obviously didn't realize Cutbirth was a wooden leg because he sends back the note that says, if Cutbirth is a problem, eliminate immediately. <laughs> Now we have another lady who made a major contribution here using her God-given skills, and that was Elizabeth P. McIntosh. She was in the Pacific Theater.
and what her job uh, the uh, enemy troops to lay down their arms. Well, it seems that she had an excellent command of the Japanese languages. And not only be, was she good at speaking the language, she could get the nuances and the sounds. And she, when she wrote, it looked like a native Japanese person had written the note. Well, it turns out that Tojo had given out a, an order to the Japanese, bless whoever sneezed, um, that you have to fight to the death or you have to have no ammunition. And the only way they better find you is unconscious. You cannot surrender. Well, this is not good because remember in the South Pacific we have all these little islands with all these little caves and people that are fighting to the death and we need to stop this. And so they, uh, they asked Ms. McIntosh, can she help them? And using paper and ink that were captured by the British, real Japanese paper and real Japanese ink. She writes a set of orders that says it's okay. If you have no ammunition, it's okay. And if, if, you're, if you just don't know that you're gonna be captured, it's okay. So what happens is they find a Japanese courier and they put this fake order in his pouch after they render him incapable of telling anybody that somebody put this in his pouch. And um, they leave him where he can be found. Well, guess what happens? This goes through this great news of you don't have to fight to the death, goes through the Japanese army like a dose of salts. And so as the troops, the Allied troops, are coming into the South Pacific to these little islands and atolls, they're finding all these guys laying unconscious on the beach and tons, literally tons, of buried ammunition. So it worked. Um, and through her, through her activity, I mean, it's a sweet story, but she saved many, many lives by bringing those um, islands under our uh, command or under, our, you know, to us quickly. Now, what else did they do? Well, they were harassing the Japanese. They were fighting behind the enemy lines and picking off small units. They were blowing up bridges. They were wrecking uh, railroads and ambushing convoys. These are the women I'm talking about now. Um, we had commando units containing women operating in 16 different nations throughout this war. Again, another statistic very rarely heard. Um, the operatives are credited with delivering more than 27,000 tons of American weapons to the underground in various countries. Um, other women were forging documents and deciphering mes messages. And remember the women in the factory that we found were better at jobs that required patience and um, you know, delicate work. Well, we also found out that women have a unique talent. They were very good at uh, doing the ciphers on these codes. Now, we had women who were keeping people informed. Um, we had Peggy Hull, who was the first United States government accredited war correspondent. Um, she dealt with the soldiers. When she was overseas, she would do interviews with each of the soldiers, and, the, and her whole purpose was to get their stories back overseas. She was totally loved because they felt that, God forbid anything happened to them, they at least would be remembered. Um, she, she wrote from places like France, Japan, and on the Russian front. Um, she was totally, her work was uh, actually looked for. Then we go to Toni Frizzell. She was a fashion photographer. Think of this. She's a fashion photographer for Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. She volunteers to fly with the Army Corps and uh, work with the Red Cross. And she's credited with thousands of images of the nurses uh, and frontline soldiers. A lot of work. She, she did a lot of work with the African American Airmen and the Wax. And then we have Marvin Breckenridge Patterson. Marvin Breckenridge is a woman. Uh, she was a photojournalist who took pictures of the first London air raids in 1939. Um, she documented all of this work. She was originally working on a book, a photo documentary book, um, that she was going to publish. Uh, she was one of the first, or one of the few American women in Europe who worked in radio. She was a friend of uh, Edward R. Murrow, and he got her a job as a broadcaster for CBS in Europe.
um, she resigned from CBS and, and decided she was going to go back and continue to work on her book until she falls in love and she marries a gentleman um, who works at the State Department. The State Department then confiscates all of her material and says she can't publish the book because it's going to put his job in jeopardy. So she gives up her personal, um, her personal beliefs and goes off and becomes a diplomat's wife. So we have no idea what we lost with this woman and her work. Uh, Esther Bugley, she was very interested. She, she took, stayed here in the States, but she worked direct, took pictures around Washington, D.C. And what she was doing was she was doing an expose of how the country itself was responding to the war and stepping up. And of course, we have Margaret Burke White here. Uh, she's probably one of the most famous photojournalists. Uh, she was on a tr troop ship that was torpedoed off the coast of North, North Africa. And then she was photographing combat missions from the planes with the air crews. And then in 1944, she actually photographed the ground and air war at Casino Valley in Italy. And it was her photographs of Buchenwald that brought the reality of what was going on with the Holocaust in Germany. She had the first photographs of um, that activity. And she's probably one of the most famous photograph uh, photographers of the time. And then we had our people here in the United States. We had did the, uh, please be careful, my bumpers are on the heap. Um, and Betty Grable, that one picture. Um, actually, Rita Hayworth was the first pinup girl. And the uh, U.S. Army actually gave their men permission to hang her pictures in their lockers, like they were going to wait, right? But anyway, Betty Grable appears in this bathing suit um, and uh, knocks Rita Hayworth off the pinnacle there. Uh, Betty Grable never left the United States. Uh, she made several appearances at bond rallies and used to sell her stockings, her nylon stockings, for thousands of dollars. Um, we have other people who were working. Carol Lombard, we all know the story of Carol. She was running around the country with her, fa her mother, actually, on a major bond drive when she was, uh, she was killed. She was 33 at the time. And in her memory, they uh, named the Liberty ship SS uh, Lombard. Hedy Lamar sold kisses for $25,000 a piece and got it. I mean, hey, whatever. Um, and Kate Smith, she's, you know, you remember Kate Smith, God bless America. Uh, she ran a 16-hour radio marathon that accrued $40 million in pledges all by herself. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, she's my most favorite. She's the lady that changed everything. She actually instituted uh, weekly press conferences for the women reporters, and she did them on a Tuesday, and the reason she limited her um, press information to female reporters was because her husband used to have his press conference on Monday and closed them to women. It was male, male uh, reporters only, so she fixed him. Uh, she's the one that was behind the Kaiser experiments, as we talked about. She also was the one that put the idea at the major plants to put full kitchens um, in place so that at the end of a shift, a weary mom could go and purchase pre-made meals um, and bring them home. Uh, she studied all the volunteer and support organizations as she traveled has not been won yet. Now the war ends and what that while there were over 18 million women in the workplace uh, by 1944, um, there was a growing concern.
those women that um, when the war ended, they would be without a job. And guess what? They were right. Many women were out there working, not only in traditional jobs, but in the non-traditional jobs in the factory, and they began to lose, as the men came home, the women were losing their jobs at a faster rate than the men were. Um, not only that, they, uh, the government turned around and said to the military women, thank you so much for what you've done, and in December of 1944, the WASPs were disbanded. Thank you so much your services are no longer needed and remember that was a civilian organization no benefits um, not until 1972 uh, by August of 45 the waves were discharged and told thank you very much for your service and um, in 1944 that remember that organization I told you that was put together to get that campaign to bring women into the workplace well that very same organization publishes a pamphlet that says do you want And they said that they have discussion points uh, amongst the couples. Uh, as military contracts were terminated, more and more women got laid off. The women magazines changed their content from come and be a production soldier, come and have the glamour of the independence and all this other thing, to motherhood is back in style. And so they went and they focused all of their writings on women who were uh, um, stories about um, the former admiration Brett um, return to your place uh, men were beginning to feel threatened again this is not invented by me these are actual statements that are printed I don't want my work, wife working, I can support her. A woman has plenty of things to do at home, she doesn't need to be out working. And I want my wife home and waiting for me when I get there. That man has never had that experience, I will tell you that right now. Um, <laughs> child care centers, that the hub of what supported women to do what they did at this time were the child care centers because it enabled them to go to work. Um, they were being closed immediately, one right after the other, after the other. Um, so now we have social changes. In her book called No Ordinary Time, Doris Kearns Goodwin states that during the Roosevelt presidency, America had experienced the most profound social revolution since the Civil War. Uh, our country would never be the same again. Our women answered the call. They found a whole new perspective on their lives, and they found a capability that they didn't know they had. They could work and be good mothers and good members of their society. In 1946, the highest divorce rate in uh, the United States had the highest divorce rate in the world. 31% uh, of the marriages were ending because as these men were coming home, and these women are saying no, um, things are falling apart very rapidly. The other thing that few people understand is that in Europe, it was never the mandate for a married woman not to work. As long as she could fulfill her role as wife and mother and whatever, she was able to go out to work if that's what she wanted to do. That's why at the turn of the century when the European immigrants came in, they were able to have their families and go to work in the laundries and every place else they had to go. In 1948, Margaret Chase Smith and Elizabeth Rogers introduced a bill 
that enable women to become permanent members of the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, and the newly formed Air Force. By 1950, women were in the majority in the American population for the first time due to the death toll overseas. Uh, marriages increased. Of course, all those folks who had put that on hold are now executing that dream of the little cottage with the picket fence, and the average number of children rose from two to three. By 1950, the, the birth rate had increased so dramatically that Sylvia Porter coins the phrase, baby boomer. It's the baby boomer. Um, and we move on to uh, women are now cutting their hair, they're wearing slacks, and they're looking for work outside the home. They're moving into new positions in the growing corporations, as many of them who served in the military were now able to use the GI Bill to go back to school. And so they're entering the professions and places where they had not been before. Um, now, in closing, Rosie the Riveter and her strong and capable image remains with the nation today. Uh, she's an inspiration to the next generation of women, which would be me. Uh, she showed them that they didn't have to settle, that they could have a choice as whether to marry or not marry. At this point, too, the stigma of not marrying was starting to fade. Um, prior to this, if a woman didn't marry or she really wanted to go to work, she was manly. There was something wrong with her. All of a sudden, now, people are saying, you know, maybe, maybe they don't have to. Um, she's also uh, using her role and her knowledge and her skills that were learned to enter the workforce and earn a paycheck, especially for those women who were left husbandless or had someone come back in a severe case of disability. She and her sisters demonstrated that women could work, learn, and produce better than, better than their male counterparts. And she was an example of women who spent years as head of the household, earning a, fa earning a living for her family, while continuing her role as a good mother, as a good member of her community, and as a, a participant in her, her religious affiliations. And some say it was the women of this era that planted the seeds for the radical changes of the 60s. Rosie and her sisters prepared the fertile ground for the women of the next generation to blossom to their full potential and take their rightful place in the world, driving all facets of life and society to a better place. And that's my story of Rosie the Riveter. I'm happy to ask you questions. How did I do, Faye? Pardon me? Is Rosie still alive? Of course. And people like you. <laughs> What she's saying is that the women after the war were able to use the GI Bill to go to college, and now they're getting into the professions as doctors <coughs> and lawyers and architects and all those places where they hadn't been before. Any other Everything you said was so familiar. I'm so glad. You know, that's what makes it hard having a Rosie in the audience, because they have to stick with the script. You know? <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank though. You. Thank you. Yes, she said that I did cover that there was rationing and that there were, the nylon stockings were not available. She went kidding. Um, they used to paint down legs. Yeah, they used to draw a stripe, but my mother said she used to put a stripe up the back of her leg with her eyebrow pencil. <laughs> getting, back to, getting back to the money, the bonds, we used to buy them at school. We used yeah. to bring so much money, and then we would fill up the book, and then we would have a bond. How wonderful. She said that as school children, they used to buy the bonds. They used to bring money and every week, uh, and then they'd get a stamp in a book, and when the book was filled up, they'd get a bond. Get How cool is that? I remember that. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Our local theater, uh, the Lyric Theater years ago, uh, we have pictures of the Tucko History Committee. There's the, uh, the owner, the proprietor of the theater, and all of us brought uh, pieces of metal all outside. We have a whole big picture of it. How wonderful. The uh, Takahosa Historical Society has a picture of the, the people bringing scrap metal and everything children. to the theater. The children bringing yeah. scrap metal to the theater uh, for the recital. Yes. Yes. Yeah, she says, uh, this lady is saying that uh, many people gave up their aluminum pots and cans 
to uh, for the for the scrap drives. Thank God you did that. It makes life okay for people like me. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I thank you again for having me back. I love you here. It's coming. Thank you so much, Trish. That was a wonderful presentation. And Trish mentioned to me that there's a women's military museum opening up in DC. They're got they're working on it. No, it's there. It's um, there. There's a woman's, especially you, Faye. There is a women's. There's a women's military museum in Washington D.C. It's relatively new. They are soliciting stories from people like you. Uh, in order to preserve the heritage of the women who served either in the military or in the civilian jobs as you did. Um, I believe you can go onto the internet and just check with, uh, it's called Women's Military Museum in Washington and you should be able to uh, get how you can input your, your um, get the form. I brought one back for my daughter-in-law because she was in Afghanistan. So. But it, it, it does exist, and if you do go there, please go look at it. It is absolutely a magnificent place. Um, it's lovely. You know, we, we all think the 1960s were the pivotal era for women's liberation, the women's movement, and even I didn't really, this is a part of history I think a lot of us, for my time, don't really realize how important it was, and that was really the, the pivotal time. So I guess it was the next generation in the 60s that probably heard a lot of this from their mothers, and. So this was fascinating. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Let's give it a hand again. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.